even five days a month are, are sufficient. And this included the insulin resistance, included longevity, included cardiac function in the mice. Dr. Longo, Walter, good to see you again. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, thanks. Good to see you. So tell us a little bit about your background for those people who don't know, and I don't know who that would be, but, and, and what led you to, you know, studying longevity and how fasting correlates with, with it? Yes, yeah, so um, I started actually working on aging uh, in college, in my second year in college. I, I always, that's all I've ever done. And, um, and then I was lucky enough to uh, work with Roy Walford at UCLA. Uh, and Roy was one of the gurus of uh, nutrition and longevity back in the early 90s. So it was 30 years ago. I started working in, in Roy's lab. And, um, you know, after that, I moved to biochemistry uh, from the pathology department. But I started studying starvation. So Roy was famous for calorie restriction, what happens to humans and mice uh, when they're eating less. And, but I ended up uh, switching to uh, uh, starvation in bacteria, then in, in simple organism, uh, and then noticing that no matter what we starve, uh, they will live longer, they become stronger. And so from this observation in, in bacteria and, and yeast, uh, baker yeast, uh, then uh, I, I became a big fan of fasting in, at a time when everybody was uh, was uh, not very impressed by aging research and even less impressed by starvation research. Both of them were considered to be uh, just uh, silly topics, you know, uh, at least back then. Yeah. So tell me, I know, you know, you and I have talked before. I've had the pleasure of having you on the podcast before. I know, uh, actually, it's been about a year now that the study came out in Nature Aging, which I think really catapulted the, the whole idea of uh, fasting or time-restricted feeding. Can you, tell, can you tell me about this study? and What was the most exciting discovery that came out of your work with Dr. Matheson? I think that um, the, um, with, with Mark, uh, it's been mainly about co uh, collaborating in trying to find out uh, you know, what kind of fasting? Fast, I always say fasting is a word. It doesn't really mean anything. It's like eating, right? So should you eat? Uh, uh, well, of course, uh, what you eat, how much you eat, and, and, and when you eat uh, um, matters, right? So it's the same for fasting. And so with Mark, I think uh, um, it was very important that the, the sort of collaboration for many years to starting to define what are the things that seem to really work? What are the things that are safe, uh, that have been demonstrated to be safe for a long time? And so how can we extract from all these ideas something that is likely to uh, make you, you know, live longer and healthier or much healthier? And so I think that, um, you know, from, from that discussion, uh, a few things emerge, you know, and one of them is certainly the 12 hours uh, um, of fasting and 12, 12 hours of feeding. And the other one, I think, at least in my case, is the fasting mimicking diet uh, done maybe three times a year. Yeah, so for those of for those folks who don't uh, know about the fasting mimicking diet, and I've actually given you tribute in all my books about the fasting mimicking diet, uh, can you can you tell us what what that means, what it entails? I think for about a hundred years that the aging field has known that some type of calorie restriction can be very good for you, but it was very clear from the work of Walford and and also the working monkeys that it's also very bad for you. And uh, so, you know, from back in those days, 30 years ago, I started thinking it's got to be a way to get all the good and not and, and none or very little of the bad. And, and so and, and thanks to the work that we were doing in simple organism, I thought, is it possible that maybe we starve a system temporarily for three, four or five days and then we go back to a normal diet for months? And could it be that that effect lasts months? Um, and so, uh, and initially it was done with, with water only fasting. And then as we started doing, you know, now it's almost 15 years ago, uh, clinical trials on cancer patients at USC, uh, we realized that uh, this was not gonna go anywhere. Water only fasting was not gonna go anywhere. I think it took us 10 years uh, to finish a, a small study on, uh, on water only fasting and chemotherapy treatment. And so uh, from there, the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute on Aging sponsor research on fasting mimicking diet. So we, we approached them and said, 
uh, we think uh, we can develop uh, FMDs uh, that are good as what are as good as water only fasting in causing these uh, uh, fasting responses. And uh, so, yeah, the, the, we were funded by the government, and uh, eventually we came up with a first demonstrating in mice, and then now demonstrated with many clinical trials, uh, beginning with normal people, but then cancer patients, uh, autoimmunities, uh, Alzheimer, uh, diabetes, uh, and hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. Now I think there's about 30 uh, clinical studies that are either being running, uh, finished, or, or, run, or currently running on, on the FMDs. So um, let's back up for a second. You, you mentioned, of course, that f fasting has some good things about it. And what are, what are the good things that you're trying to achieve with fasting, number one? And number two, uh, how do you eat and not be fasting? I guess is the, is the second question that everybody says, well, wait a minute, if you're eating, that can't be fasting, but you're saying it's a fasting mimicking diet. So what are, you know, what are the good things about fasting? Yeah, so the, um, the clinical trials are now consistently suggesting, number one, probably this reset uh, and the reset seems to be affecting almost everything. So it, when you look at the mice, we actually show, uh, we demonstrate regeneration. So the, the organs shrink during the fasting mimicking diet, and then the stem cells are turned on, and then when the mouse refeeds, we see many different organs beginning to have these stem cells generate new stem cells and generate new cells. And so basically regenerating the organ or at least part of the system or organ. And uh, so that's uh, that's probably at the center of a lot of these resets. And one of them seems to be insulin resistance, right? So uh, probably uh, we come from a history of uh, uh, eating lots of the times and fasting lots of the times, and now we eat all the time. And so the system uh, probably goes into insulin resistance uh, for a good reason to, to store fat. And, uh, but at some point you wanna use the fat, right? So, so it looks like the fasting and the fasting mimicking diet switch the system back into a fat utilization mode. Now, if you go too, fat, too far, this can change, right? Then you might enter a thrifty mode where now the metabolism slows down. So we, we, our job was to get it right just to the point where the, the, keto, the ketogenesis begins, the breakdown begins, it is feasible for the patient, but the thrifty mode, this metabolic slowdown does not begin, right? Uh, yeah, so that's that's the idea. And of course, you know, there could be lots of other things that, that are involved in addition to the stem cells, autophagy, certainly a, a name thrown out there a lot, but it's not clear how much of it happens, when it happens, you know, how long you need in the various cells to actually get a lot of autophagy done. Um, it doesn't seem to happen a lot in the first two or three days. It probably is happening starting day four or five of the fasting mimicking diet. And then, you know, what is the fasting mimicking diet? It's a, it's a low uh, calorie, low protein, low sugar, high fat, vegan diet, right? So the, the, uh, my idea was to, um, well, we, we knew what each ingredient was doing to each factor. For example, IGF-1, IGF-PP-1, ketone bodies, and glucose. So a lot of people did just uh, names. But, but let's say that these are markers that we know to be very important for the starvation response. So first, we wanted to get the, the levels of the macronutrients or the proteins, et cetera, to make sure that all those move in the right direction. Um, and, then, um, and then we wanted to do it in a way consistent with the longevity zones of the world, right? So we, I figured you were a Loma Linda, uh, so you're very well aware of, of you know, the type of diet that these zones uh, consume. And so I thought it was a good idea to not just pick ingredients that could get these changes, but pick ingredients that were also very healthy. So should somebody do this a lot of times, um, it, would, uh, it would help in other ways. And I think it was a good it's a good idea, and you know we, we have some evidence, for example, from microbiota changes that seem to be uh, caused by the content of the diet and not just the fasting uh, component. Yeah. Now, you and I uh, have come under, I won't use the word, maybe I'll use the word attack, that uh, 
protein restriction is, is part of a fasting mimicking diet, but uh, animal protein seems to be much more mischievous than plant-based protein in terms of its amino acid content and activating mTOR signaling. Uh, can you take us through your, your reasoning, you know, why a vegan diet, uh, why not just have animal protein and cut the calories? Yeah, so, so I, I, I'm not a, a fan of the vegan diet, first of all. Uh, so I'm a fan of what I call the longevity diet, that, you know, on which my book is based, and um, and it's a pescatarian, essentially a pescatarian diet. But you know, I think we need to move away from names and get into, and I think you agree with the, with that, into um, uh, age specific, sex specific, person specific, et cetera, et cetera. But I say in general, fish plus vegan seems to be very good, right? and then up to 65, and then after 65, it seems that yeah, more of a variety of foods uh, it, it helps the elderly uh, keep up, right? So it seems that, that the 80-year-old doesn't do very well uh, with a, a vegan or even a, a, a pescatarian diet unless there is a lot of animal uh, proteins uh, or an, enough uh, animal protein. So we published on this in 2014. And and uh, and, and the, what we published based on the the United States uh, uh, population studied by in the Enhance uh, database, it was very clear that um, if you restrict the, the, the population, the U.S. population that had the protein restriction, this fairly severe protein restriction, they were doing very well. But that was only true up to 65 years of age. When we look at the 70, 80, 90 year olds that reported having a very low protein diet, they did very poorly. Right, so. So this is why we can start coming up with this idea of age specific, you know, age range specific uh, nutrition. And uh, and so why is that? Well, you know, there's amino acids that are very low in the legumes, particularly the legumes. And lots of lots of people that uh, have vegan diets may have uh, may get a lot of their proteins from the legumes. Um, and also, I think uh, uh, even if you get it from the legumes, which are very low in certain essential amino acids, uh, it's very difficult to get. Let's say you're somebody weighing 70 kilograms or, or let's say somebody weighing 120 pounds is very difficult to get the uh, 50 grams of proteins that you would need from just eating the legumes. And even if you do get it, they're going to be very low in certain amino acids. So that seems to be actually very beneficial up to age 65 or 70. And then it becomes uh, uh, appears to become very detrimental. So you're, uh, I agree with you. I, I call my diet a veg aquarian diet, uh, which I, I guess is a pescatarian diet. Uh, I concentrate on eating, you know, greens, and then we tend to supplement with uh, wild shellfish, mollusks, uh, uh, clams, and oysters, and and mussels. Uh, but that's another subject. So. But you specifically, and we'll get into this, you, you have a, a diet uh, package that's called Prolong, love, love the name, uh, that is, is a five-day five uh, vegan fast. And so during that time, you definitely see, at least for a limited time, a benefit of just strictly avoiding animal protein. Yeah, so when you're talking about the periodic fasting mimicking diet, right. that yeah, then we go 100% vegan, uh, and I think it's uh, uh, it's very very important to get the uh, so because we already have very low protein, but I think by by being vegan, we get certain amino acids to be even lower, which is exactly what we want. So we we want to have a fasting response uh, when you're not fasting. So we have to use lots of tricks. You know, that's one of them. But but in the FMD uh, that we tested clinically, we have lots of tricks. Uh, each trying to achieve something something different, you know, and and including um, making you less hungry, uh, including um, having reserves for people whose uh, gluconeogenic reserves, so that the, the liver can make a new glucose. Uh, and we have tricks in there also to make sure that there are reserves in case you need more glucose, so that um, that you don't pass out, right? So so, so yeah, so so that. The, the, there's a lot, a lot of technology actually in those five days, and uh, but but we try to make it uh, so that for people it's just uh, 
five days of vegan food, you know. So, you know, in, in your book, you talk about the five pillars of longevity. Uh, how, how did you come to narrow those pillars down in turn to five concepts? So I had spent 30 years uh, uh, doing this with lots of the world experts uh, on nutrition and longevity. And I just thought about what would be important for me uh, when I'm designing a clinical trial, when I'm designing an epidemiological trial. So, uh, and when I'm trying to come up with a, with something that I feel is not going to be disputed or found to be wrong uh, in, in five years. So how do I come up with that? And I just thought I was very surprised that uh, most of the data out there comes from epidemiological studies. right? And, and that, as I was doing it, my own epidemiological studies, I think I learned that, wait a minute, depending on what group you, you select, you can get the opposite results. So I thought epidemiology is, a, is an incredible pillar but you cannot be alone, right? It has to match. So how do you make a mouse or a rat or a monkey live longer? Right? Uh, it has to match that. And it has to match, well, what about the clinical tr uh, trials? What if I randomize two groups, 100 and 100, and I give them low protein, high protein, what happens to them? You know, how long does it last? And then I also thought uh, one of the most important pillars was the centenarians. You know, if I go around the world and I do that this all the time, and I speak to the centenarians, um, do they do what I what these other three pillars uh, allow me to come up with, or, or do they do something completely different, right? And and then finally, I just thought from from physics and reductionism, um, you know, what what about a car and or a plane? How do they age? You know, do they? What are the problems that accumulate? So yeah, if you take a car, for example, one of these big dilemmas is should you run a lot or or not? You know, and so. And, and the, the data is not that easy to understand. Is it good to run 100 miles a week? Uh, and some people say yes, but then, you know, the, the, I go to pillar number five and I say, well, is it good to, you know, drive a car for 300 miles a day? Uh, I mean, most people say probably not, right? So in the long run, uh, I don't think it's going to be such a good idea, right? So, yeah, so I think that if pillar number five, complicated systems, allows to, to look at a plane, you know, so for a plane, is it good to fly a plane around uh, uh, 10 times a day for, for 50 years and, and never change its parts, right? So probably not, right? So yeah, so the, 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 that together we look for the common denominator and I feel, and I think I, I got it absolutely right, you know, yesterday uh, Plus Medicine published a study from Norwegian group uh, showing meta-analysis or meta-analysis on food and sure enough, you know, what came out of it was a pretty much the longevity diet, so fish, and then um, lots of vegetables. Um, and they didn't talk about low protein, but certainly that it would be hard to have a high protein diet eating like that. Uh, um, and um, and fruit was there, but it was uh, it was not uh, it was neutral. It looked like about like a neutral effect. So probably good and bad, right? As you also pointed out in your book. You know. Yeah. So what? Which of the if you're going to choose one of those five pillars? Uh, what what do you think has the most impact, or are they really all all equal? I think that uh, I mean I, if, maybe the complicated system uh, would be not necessary per se. I mean I, I um, it's not easy to make the scientific case that that's gonna gonna be essential. But uh, yeah, I would say the other uh, and the centenarians. You could argue it's. Um, it's just observation, um, but I think they're all equal. Yeah, because in the end, uh, uh, if you don't actually see uh, something being practiced by a lot of people for a hundred years, uh, you do you are introducing no matter what the numbers say, you are introducing a certain level of risk. Right. So, for example, as we're starting to think about rapamycin and drugs that treat aging, so a lot, a lot of people are getting excited about potential drugs that uh, treat aging, but but then you have to say, well, will it be okay eventually if I make everybody live eight uh, percent longer, and I make ten uh, percent of the people live twenty percent shorter, right? Uh, I don't think it's okay, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I would rather say, hey, you know, everybody should live uh, normal, and I'm not, um, I'm not advertising uh, this type of diet, right? So yeah, so I think that, um, you know, it, let's say rapamycin, if we had, uh, you know, thousands of people that made it to hundred. Uh, uh, and, and almost nobody that, that we heard from 
saying, I think I, I died a lot earlier because of this rapamycin. So that would be good to have before making the recommendation to healthy people, right? Not, not necessarily to uh, somebody who's got a disease, but to healthy people. Well, let's go out on a limb. Do you think we should have a, a low-dose rapamycin trial or an intermittent rap rapamycin trial? Yeah, I think that they're going to do it. Right? Metformin is going to be tested, and then rapamycin is uh, some form of TOR inhibitor is going to be tested, and, and, and that's good, you know. I mean, um, uh, we're the one that discovered that, that role of that pathway in, in aging back in 2001 in yeast. Uh, so I'll be very happy if somebody, uh, and metformin is, is interfering with the same pathways, um, but in, metformin seems to be affecting both of the, what we described as the sugar pathway and the, uh, the protein pathway, aging pathway. Uh, so yeah, I would love to see it, but I think it's a, it's a long uh, to, to come up with a conclusion that I give this to, uh, to somebody and uh, everybody's gonna benefit and almost nobody uh, is gonna uh, be negatively affected. It's gonna be very hard. So this is why I really like the nutrition. For the next 20 years, I see the nutrition dominating. Um, and then eventually, yes, we may have enough data 20, 30 years from now to say, okay, we got this pill. Look, you know, people, uh, we've been studying this for 30 years and nobody got hurt, hurt by this. We have epidemiology on it uh, and and everybody's living 12% longer. Uh, yeah, so I think at that, at that point, uh, it might be much more convincing to go with the drugs. I want to, uh, that brings up a really good point that I talk a lot about, including in my new book, uh, unlocking the keto code, uh, metabolic health, or what I call metabolic flexibility. And I think you and I both agree that one of the things that's killing all of us, uh, particularly in America, is that, that most people uh, actually have no metabolic flexibility. They're not able to shift in their mitochondria from burning glucose as a fuel to burning free fa fatty acids or ketones. Uh, tell me about the effect of fasting and the fasting mimicking diet on metabolic health, or maybe give me your thoughts on our poor metabolic health in the United States. Yeah, so I think it connects to what we were discussing earlier, right? So that eventually organs, uh, particularly, I think there is a dual process. Um, regulated by the same foods, pro mostly by proteins and, and sugars, right? And and one of them is uh, fat accumulation, and which goes along with insulin resistance. And the other one is actually aging, right? So I think you have a parallel effect on uh, obesity, overweight, accumulation of fat, establishment of insulin resistance, and on the other side, you're pushing the growth factor, growth hormone, IGF-1, and, and also insulin, you, you're pushing those to, to be accelerating something that cannot, should not be accelerated. Nothing's growing, nothing is reproducing. So essentially we are in a reproduction mode all the time, but nobody's reproducing. Uh, yeah, so, so I think that, that uh, first of all, the fasting mimicking diet is going after, well, it's going after all of it, right? because I think it was there for that purpose. Not the fasting, my fasting was there for that purpose. I think fasting was there for the purpose of resetting the system periodically, right? And so since everybody starved once in a while, there was no need to, to impose it. It was, it was like unavoidable. Normal. <laughs> yeah, normal and unavoidable. So, so you know, I don't, I, I don't need you uh, to, uh, to make you tired biologically because you're gonna sleep anyway. So in this case, I don't need you to impose biologically fasting because you're gonna fast. But, um, but, but then it was probably A, as I mentioned earlier, set, resetting this catabolic mode, fat burning mode, and then telling the cells of the, of the fat and muscle, et cetera, okay, now it's not time to be resistant anymore. Now let's embrace insulin and let's bring in the, bring in the sugar. Uh, we don't need to uh, have ins lots of insulin, you know, accumulating fat anymore because we're using it. Um, so, yeah, so on one side, th that's a process. And then th on the other side, I think that as we see now with many clinical trials, um, you have long-term effects on leptin, long-term effect on IGF-1. So you, you do the fasting mimicking diet, 
but the effect on IGF-1 goes on for months. So we looked at three months after the end of the diet, and it was still there. Um, so, so yeah, so long-lasting effects that are, uh, I think, representing a, um, an anti-inflammatory, anti-aging modality. It doesn't last forever. After, you know, after a while, I think it's starting. So even already at three months post, we see about 40% of the effects disappearing, right? So suggesting that by six months, it, you're getting back to where you started, right? I mean, uh, provided that you, you go back to a, a terrible diet. So in, in fact, a couple of months ago, we published, you know, what happens to mice if we give them a terrible high sugar, you know, bad, uh, lots of fat, lots of sugar, lots of calorie diet, and the mice become huge. And then, um, but we do it together with five days amount of the FMD, and we pretty much reverse all the all the bad effects of this, you know, high high calorie diet, sort of Western high calorie diet. And yeah, so then suggesting that um, even five days a month are are sufficient. And this included the insulin resistance, included longevity, included cardiac function in the mice. Um, so. Cholesterol levels, cholesterol levels shoot up to very, very high uh, by uh, 30 months in the mice. And uh, and this five days amount of the FMD uh, uh, brought it back to normal. Right? So, um, yeah, so I think that uh, that's really an overall very broad effect uh, underlining the probably evolved nature of it. Right. So it's, it'll be strange that it affects inflammation and affects IGF-1 and affects cholesterol, blood pressure. I mean, name it, right? So how, how can it be if it wasn't there for the purpose of fixing things? And also differential effects. As somebody that starts with a blood pressure 110, we don't lower it. If somebody starts with a blood pressure 110, 100, we might even see an increase in blood pressure, right? And same thing for glycemia. We see lots of people in the 70s going up in fasting glucose, right? Uh, and that's, I think, exactly what we want. You know, we don't want to, in calorie restriction instead, that's the opposite. Push everything down and down and down uh, possibly, um, you know, reaching a threshold, a minimum threshold, which should not be surpassed. Yeah, I know your uh, your mentor was Ray Wolford, and I've certainly studied him extensively when I started down this path. And, uh, you know, he w was the father of calorie restriction. What, you know, what mistakes were made in in calorie restriction? Why isn't that at least for humans, a, a great viable long-term solution. Yeah, I don't. I don't think Roy made mistakes. I think Roy was just too early, right? Uh, it was a period where molecular biology didn't exist. The whole genetics of aging field uh, was started uh, um, by a group of us, actually, uh, back then, and uh, um, and so they did not have those available. Uh, he did not have those available, but I think you know. In the end, uh, the mistakes of the, the the problems with calorie restriction are, first of all, is the chronic nature of it, and the fact that you know it pushes your weight and, and muscle and bone, etc., to a very low level, which most people, whether it's healthy for you or not, will not want gonna do. So already, 99% of the people are out because if you look at Walford uh, during Biosphere two years when he was. Uh, uh, under calorie restriction, he did not look good, and he knew that, right? So and he knew that. Um, and then I think it's also the, the trade-offs, right? So probably um, we see that the refeeding part of the FMD is as important, or mo mo maybe more important than the fasting. And so, because the refeeding is the building moment, so calorie restriction, with calorie restriction, refeeding never comes. Um, and so, and also calorie restriction. Now we know there is the thrifty mode is entered. So now. Now, not, let's say you lose 20% of your weight and you go to a very low BMI, body mass index, but now your metabolism might, might slow down 30%. And, and so now you have to eat almost nothing uh, to, uh, to not gain weight. So, um, yeah, so then, then if you look at the monkey study, you'll see a bottom with scan. I mean, at the end, National Institute on Aging, you see no effect. Uh, or little effect, some on diseases, but in Wisconsin, you see a big effect on diseases, uh, diabetes, incredible effect, uh, cardiovascular disease, about a 50% decrease, and cancer, about a 30% uh, decrease, uh, sorry, 50% uh, in cancer and 20, 30% in cardiovascular, um, but, uh, but then if you look at overall mortality, the monkeys are living a, 
a little bit longer if they're calorie restricted, but uh, but not that much longer, right? So then then uh, yeah, so this is suggesting that the trade-offs are are um, are pretty high, and uh, and and so we learned a lot from it, but uh, but I think we need to move to uh, uh, more feasible and, and more effective intervention. Let me let me ask you your opinion. Um, what do you think? Uh, you know, Dr. Rafael de Cabo from the NIH has, has certainly proposed that maybe a, a part of calorie restriction, certainly in an animal model, is that we're controlling the time of eating of these animals, and that the calorie restricted animals are going to eat all their food very quickly because they're hungry, and it's the period of time of fasting every 24 hours that may be having a huge effect uh, from the calorie restriction. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, so, so this work both by Rafa and by uh, Sachin Panda. And uh, yeah, I think that um, I, uh, I, I recommend uh, uh, 12 hours of, of, uh, of fasting and 12 hours of feeding. Uh, I think as you go to the breakfast skippers, uh, you start to see uh, negative effects, right? And, and it doesn't mean that the fasting is causing the negative effects, but uh, I always uh, was worried about why is it that the people that skip breakfast are consistently living shorter? Uh, and, um, and so, you know, one concern would be with the 16-8, or so, not with the 12, right? I, I, I really, have, I always say I've never seen any negative uh, uh, studies on 12 hours, 12, 13 hours of fasting every day. But as you get to the 16, particularly if breakfast keeping is involved, uh, now you start seeing the negatives and you have to think about, you know, is it possible that the, keto, the ketone bodies uh, are now potentially putting, uh, uh, you know, these very high levels all the time of ketone bodies are potentially putting a strain on the cardiovascular system. Uh, so we don't know. It may have nothing to do with that. Uh, but um, I think that, um, you know, with these 16 hours all the time, um, you know, and maybe the cycles, you know, could it be that it's just very high levels and very low levels and it's just going back and forth uh, is causing some some problems? Or is there something having nothing to do with with fasting, right? So, yeah, it could be. And it could be if you did that with skipping dinner, now you don't have the problem at all and you'll have a much lo a longer lifespan. So we don't know. So it'd be nice to know to have the dinner skipping studies, uh, which, uh, which may dif be difficult to do because maybe not too many people skip dinner. You know? Yeah, when I, when I wrote my last book, The Energy Paradox, I really wanted to have people skip dinner and just eat breakfast and lunch. And... I couldn't get my patients to do it, yeah. and and it's hard for me because my wife and I really only see each other at dinner, and it's like what I'm going to watch her eat while you know I'm not, and it's very hard to implement. But you uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This past year d during COVID, you published a study looking at uh, giving people a fast bar, your basically nut bar. Uh, for for breakfast as their only food, and you showed that they stayed in ketosis for four hours even after eating that bar. You, and you want to elaborate on that? And I I agree with that, by the way. And I yeah. mentioned it in the in the new book. Yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, that study had to do with br having breakfast, but not interfering with the fasting, right? So the idea was if there's something about um, breakfast that is uh, uh, not having breakfast that is detrimental, uh, let's, let's give the patient back breakfast, uh, but let's allow at least a, 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 you know, a moderate level of ketogenesis to continue. Um, yeah, so I think that that's definitely a step up from skipping breakfast. You know, that, that was my thought, right? So, so, you know, could it be the best step up or, or, or maybe health way? But even if it was health way, uh, it was really designed for people that were going to skip breakfast anyway. And uh, and so maybe now uh, they can have breakfast, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and, and continue to get some of the benefits of the fasting. Did you find any um, benefits to doing that 
rather than than just skipping breakfast? I mean, was there was there a positive outcome of having uh, you know a fast bar or you know a handful of nuts? The trial was designed uh, uh, to just look at uh, uh, you know can you uh, can you skip uh, can you have breakfast and have the fasting effects at the same time, right? Right. Yes, yeah, so that was the design. It wasn't designed to to see whether the ketogenesis that or or the the high level of ketone bodies um, uh, would uh, would have additional benefits. Uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of studies suggesting that lots of benefits of, of the ketone bodies, uh, um, but um, but that that was not the design of the study to to look at uh, what the ketone ketone bodies can do. You know. Uh, I'm sure everybody wants to know, because they always want to know about me, so what do you do? I mean, are, are you having a fasting mimicking diet uh, one week a month, or um, you know, just describe your day? Well, I mean, uh, I, have, I'm, I have a very fairly strict uh, longevity diet, right? So we're uh, fish maybe uh, three times a week. Um, with some variety and then, um, you know, lots of legumes, uh, I mean, tons of legumes every night and th tons of vegetables, you know, I probably have seven or eight servings uh, uh, of vegetables uh, per day, uh, of leg legumes and vegetables per day. Um, then uh, I, um, uh, I, I have, uh, you know, pasta uh, almost every day, but I have limited amounts, right? So I, I keep it about 70 grams. That's my that's my dose at night. I don't eat lunch unless I am back to my ideal weight. So now, for example, for a past I, I, when I'm in Italy, it's very hard to not have lunch. So <laughs> I, I have to say I, I failed uh, to uh, to have the lunch skipping mode in Italy. But then I come back to California and um, and then I'm able to to do that. And just have coffee for lunch. Uh, it works better for me. Um, and so, yeah. So Monday through Friday, I, I just have coffee for uh, a tall, uh, sorry, American coffee for uh, for lunch, and um, and that works very well. I mean, that, that allows me to control uh, my weight uh, uh, very easily. And and the beauty of that, and this is why I talk about it in my book. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned that in your book, but uh, the beauty of that is that. You suffer for about a month, right? a month, month and a half. And the, at the beginning, when you do that, it's terrible you know, because you, you're looking for lunch. And then, basically, I've been doing it for 20 years. For the rest of your life, it's just complete. Lunch becomes completely optional. So your brain rewires probably to understand that I already know it's optional. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't have it. And uh, and now by having the weekend lunch, oh, I always have lunch for the in the weekend, even if I'm in California. By having these two things, and it, it, the, the, I think my my system is very well adapted to going back and forth, and it understands that that's just completely optional. Um, yeah, so I I I, uh, I, I think uh, now we're starting a study, a clinical study in, in southern Italy, where we're going to do this and and try to make it um, you know tested and see. What happens, and and um, you know what the compliance is. Um, so we're taking a population of 500 people, and we're splitting into two, and then we're going to do a randomized crossover trial where we basically put everybody in the ideal, you know, longevity diet, both fasting making diet and longevity diet. Yeah, and then the fasting making diet, I do it, uh, I do it maybe a couple times a year, just because I have such a strict already uh, longevity diet plus every day um, skipping lunch. Uh, I, I don't want to overdo it yet. Great. Uh, now, you, I know you've been doing this for, you know, 30 years and working and studying longevity. What are the, can you share some of the results that you've witnessed from your work and specific people overcoming, you know, major illnesses or other stories you can share? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I was very proud of the clinical trial, randomized 125 patients in, in done the, by uh, 12 uh, Dutch hospitals, uh, looking at uh, breast cancer patients receiving chemotherapy with or without uh, the, the FMD, the fasting mimicking diet. And, uh, and um, uh, we actually saw a dose response, right? The more cycles of the fasting mimicking diet, the better the... Uh, either the clinical or the pathological response was uh, of the chemo 
against the tumor. And so I think there was a difference between those that never did the FMD uh, and those that, that did almost every cycle of the FMD. There's a five-fold difference in the portion of non-responders, right? So, you know, remarkable. And uh, I, understanding that is one of the sort of larger level studies. And now we've done uh, maybe about 10 studies on this topic and cancer and FMD. So the cancer looks very, very promising. Um, and uh, we just finished a study on hypertension. Uh, we just finished a study on uh, diabetes. Uh, I cannot talk about the results, but uh, let me talk about the ones that we already published, which is uh, the 2017 study where we saw pre lots of pre-diabetics coming back to a non, uh, completely non-pre-diabetic state. Um, and, uh, and we also saw um, you know, the people that have mild hypertension uh, returning to uh, to normal uh, if they were not taking drugs. And uh, yeah, so let's say that uh, everything is consistent with that. And also um, HbA1c, uh, HbA1c is, uh, seems to be, um, there seems to be a, a good effect on lowering that. So the, 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 the hope is that, um, the hope is that uh, we provide a, sort of like a food medicine type of intervention for, uh, um, you know, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, diabetes, and, and probably also a portion of, of cardiovascular uh, patients. Um, is there a difference in gender? Do men and women respond differently? Are there tricks for men or women? We have done now... People don't realize how expensive and, and, and painful mice, mouse studies are. Uh, but uh, we finished finally male and female with the FMD lifelong, right? They have to say that we see very similar effects in both sexes. And, uh, and in the clinical trials thus far, when we analyzed the, 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 the males and female people, uh, we don't, uh, we see very similar effects. Um, so, yeah, so it's good news, and, and obviously when you try to move it from mice to people, um, then I guess it would be very surprising if it works, you know, let's say mice, rats, and, and people, but in people it just happen to work only in one sex, you know, but it's possible, but yeah, that's not what we're seeing. We've seen pretty, pretty similar results thus far, you know. No, that's good news because, you know, a lot of times we, we hear on the internet uh, that well, women should be careful. This uh, this is not what a woman wants to do. It works great on men, but be careful, women. Uh, and I, I get that question all the time. But you're not seeing that. I think everybody should be careful. Um, you know, and uh, I, I you know I um, I see some irrational exuberance as uh, Greenspan used to say. Um, yeah, so so I will avoid th this idea of oh I'm fasting and I cook it up at home and I, yeah this is just gonna do eventually more damage than good you know what I see right now is probably gonna do more damage than good, and uh, particularly um, seeing the latest uh, you know the latest thing the flavor of the month and I'm gonna go home and try it right yeah so I think I, I really encourage people to. Uh, to think about the five pillars and think about 30, 40 years of accumulated research versus uh, uh, thinking about, oh, I heard this on the news, so I'm going to go home and do it. Um, yeah, so um, um, let's, uh, let's try to see what a few things that can be done, how they should be done, who they should be done with, right? So somebody that's got BMI of 18 is very different. Somebody's got BMI of, of 28. And, um, and so, um, and somebody as you pointed out in, in, in your, your first book, um, you know, there are ingredients that, that uh, seem to be very good for you and maybe they're very bad for you, you know, um, and uh, like tomatoes, for example, right? So, 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 yeah, I think things that are, everybody wants a simple, simple solution and, and the solution is way more complicated than people realize. It's not that hard to do, right? The good news is, once you got the experts telling you, okay, you don't eat tomatoes, right? Uh, then it's not that hard. Or maybe only eat the tomato paste, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So then it's not hard. But if you don't know, it's devastating to you. Um, and so, and so, yeah, so I think it's the same for fasting. You know, you, you, you got to work with products and people and doctors that know what they're doing 
And then it's easy. Don't worry about it. It's not about revolutionizing your life. We, I have two clinics for the foundation, my, my uh, nonprofit foundation. And, you know, and we tailor everything to, to, uh, to what the needs of people are. Yeah, you know, okay, I, I can't let you go uh, eating a lot of legumes. Uh, I eat a lot of legumes. I eat a lot of beans. A lot, I eat a lot of lentils. But I soak and pressure cook them. And I had Joel Furman uh, eat to live on my podcast recently and got him to admit that he pressure cooks his beans. Uh, what say you, Walter? I don't know, but I, you know, <laughs> am I, um, I mean, clearly, I think you're absolutely right once there is a, um, a moment of microbiota disruption, right? Yes. Which is right. probably in a pretty good percentage of the population, right? Yeah. So once the disruption, which you talk about also, happens, then I think uh, the legumes may start becoming a problem to lots of people. I mean, not cooking. I, I never tried the pressure cooking, but, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it for a long time. I want to try it out, right? So, 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 but, but I would say, you know, um, I think in the past it was not an issue because people were not exposed to all these antibiotics and You're all, right. all these uh, drugs and, and, you know, and crazy interventions. Uh, but now that ev almost everybody is, you know, so how many people are out there that, uh, have enough of a disruption where that, you know, those prebiotic uh, uh, ingredients are now causing a problem. Uh, yeah, so I think absolutely very interesting. Now we, I have several people in the lab working on that, so uh, working also on some of your ideas. And so, you know, we're trying to, to, to get the science out of it, the exact, you know, what's about e e all these different ingredients. And some of this is remarkable. I mean, we see dead mice, you know, on some of these, these ingredients that everybody eats. And that, that's some of it's shocking, right? So, so absolutely, I think that's, uh, it needs a lot of, a lot of research and, uh, and the pressure cooking, I mean, is there a, a, a scientific uh, explanation? So is a breakdown of a particular ingredient? Is that, is that what the pressure cooking? Yeah, uh, yeah, pressure cooking actually can break, you know, these lectin proteins. It won't break gluten, inter interestingly enough. Um, but, you know, there's actually an Italian company, and I have no relation, a Jovial, that actually soaks and pressure cooks their beans. And uh, I actually use their brand, and, and they're fantastic. And they're from Italy, so, you know, come on. Uh, there you go. Try them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it called? Jovial, like a happy person. Yeah, yeah. Jovial. Interesting. Has, and they, they have it in glass jars. So it's in lots of stores nowadays. Uh, so look for it. And We'll talk. <laughs> well, listen, it's been great, you know, having you on the on the program again. Um, what's on the horizon for you? What's what's next? You're always so busy. I think uh, we we are uh, doing lots of clinical trials, and uh, now we just approached the FDA uh, for the first, uh, you know, FDA uh, track uh, on cancer drugs. You know, food-based, uh, you know, fasting-mimicking diet uh, for for hormone therapy treatment, and so we put together 11 of the some of the best hospitals in the world: MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, etc. And uh, we're hoping to start very soon uh, a large trial and and uh, on that uh, which is FDA um, track. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I hope that um, you know we'll we'll start lots of uh, uses of these uh, FMDs and diseases with the doctors, with uh, what I call the team, right? So, so we need, uh, you know, nutritionist, dietitian, doctor, psychologist. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, I think that's the future is to have these teams uh, having the tools, but also the teams that, that can apply it. Um, and uh, that's what we're working on now. Yeah. Great. And uh, where can people find you? Where can they find your company for fasting, mimicking diets, uh, et cetera? Yeah, okay. The, the company, I cannot mention it, but it's easy to find, right? So uh, I, I won't. Uh, you mentioned it before. I did it. Yeah, I happen to <laughs> spill the beans. So and, to uh, but I also, we have a foundation clinic uh, in, in uh, Santa Monica here. It's called Create Cures uh, uh, Foundation Clinic. And, uh, and uh, so everybody should, uh, um, should consider it, uh, with especially cancer patients and people with. Uh, 
big problems but uh, but everybody is uh, is welcome uh, we have a, a a group of dietitians that are very well qualified yeah. great well again thanks thanks for having coming on the show again and we'll look forward to reading more about you almost every month you publish a great new study and keep up the good work okay thanks a lot thanks a lot bye Walter. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast. Make sure to check out the next one here. Eating constantly, eating multiple small meals a day, as I show in the Energy Paradox, is one of the best ways to deplete your energy.